Lauren Shirtliff, senior planner with the BRA, as well as members from our consultant team here at the end, Matthew Littell, Steve McHugh, as well as uh, Tom Skinner. Um, I'd also like to note uh, Matt Conti from uh, northendwaterfront.com is videotaping today's meeting, uh, so the, today's meeting will be available through uh, northendwaterfront.com as well as through the uh, project's webpage. Um, also like to note that today we have uh, Rick Camino who's volunteered to chair uh, the committee as uh, Jack Hart is out today. Um, I'd also like to introduce a new advisory committee member, uh, Tom Wooters. It's taking uh, Sam Grant Thornberg we left, so Tom will be representing the, the Harbor Towers community. Thank you, Tom. Um, and in prior meetings, we had indicated we've been providing updates on the South Boston Waterfront uh, Transportation Plan. Uh, it's a multi-state city agency uh, planning effort led by ABC. Um, the very first uh, community meeting uh, as part of that effort will be held May 7th, I believe that's two weeks from today, at 6 p.m., and that will be at the uh, Boston uh, Convention and Exhibition Center in South Boston. Uh, so if you need more information on that, the website is sbwaterfrontmobility.org. I can provide that to you later if you'd like. Um, so first up today, we have uh, Tom Skinner, who's part of our consultant team. We asked Tom to develop some recommendations on a proposed framework or approach uh, through which the advisory committee can review and analyze uh, the specific parcels within the downtown waterfront area, looking at um, you know, the primary substitutions that will be involved, as well as uh, anticipated <laughs> offsets and, and metrics related to that. So with that, Tom? Um, Thanks, Chris. You all hear me? Yeah. Right. Um, we come back peri peri yeah, periodically to um, uh, provide uh, presentations on the municipal harbor planning process. Today, we really wanted to start getting into a little bit of the meat of the plan. Um, I showed this to some uh, to a group, uh, an earlier version of this presentation, <laughs> and I just leapt right into the framework. And they said, whoa, 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 what about all the uh, chapter 91 stuff? Expect us to remember that. And I said, well, I don't know, do you? So to start this presentation off, I wanted to at least offer to do a quick rundown of uh, what we've covered before, chapter 91, municipal harbor plans, and uh, the last slide from my last presentation, which is what goes into a municipal harbor plan. Um, if you think that would be helpful, I'll just keep going. Yes? Okay. Um, <clears throat> they said this is the framework for, for our proposed framework, which we will present to the city. The city has not uh, signed off on this. It is uh, based on uh, uh, our views um, as MHP consultants, um, uh, based on what we've heard from the public, what we've heard at Charette's, what has been in the public well plan, what uh, the city submis submitted in the notice to proceed, and our understanding of Chapter 91 and the Municipal Harbor Plan about how to structure this, uh, this Municipal Harbor Plan. There are uh, probably thousands of ways to craft an individual Municipal Harbor Plan, so there's no one set formula. And what we'd like today is to get uh, feedback from you and comments on what we would uh, propose to the city. After the review, there are five general areas that I wanted to cover. The first is the geographic scope, followed by uh, the potential substitute provisions uh, and offsets. Uh, that would be divided into four different categories, open space, uh, height, facilities of private tenancy, and water dependent uh, use zone. So this is the review. Chapter 91 is the Massachusetts Public Waterfront Act. It protects the public rights to filled and flowed tidelands establishes a priority for water dependent uses, you can still have non-water dependent uses such as uh, residences, um, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, retail, but they're subject to eight dimensional standards. We've covered these before. They include height, uh, open space, and uh, what is often referred to as setback. It's, it's uh, uh, actually called the water dependent use zone. And uh, there's a higher standard for public benefits on Commonwealth Islands. In this area, there are the green shaded areas at the end of the wards. Um, most of this area is, is considered private islands. They're still 
uh, is uh, there still are public re uh, benefits required uh, uh, even on private titlings, but there's a higher standard on Commonwealth titlings. Those eight dimensional standards can be uh, tailored to meet a community's individual needs, <coughs> and that's done through a municipal harbor plan. Um, so uh, through this plan, remember, we, we try not to use the word variance uh, because uh, DEP Chapter 91 variance is something else, but this is in effect a way to provide a variance to those uh, numeric standards that govern building height, setback, and open space. And uh, these are, are determined in large part based on what the community's vision for that waterfront uh, is. The three primary ways that those uh, that a waterfront or the standards are tailored are through the substitute provisions, uh, your height, the offsets, uh, which are the benefits that are then provided to mitigate the impacts of that height, and amplifications. We aren't going to get to amplifications today. Um, it's less complex to do them, um, but they can be a very important part of the municipal harbor plan. Amplifications. Uh, provide greater detail on standards in Chapter 91 regulations that do not have a number attached to them. So if they say the waterfront should be activated for the public, an amplification provides uh, more specificity in terms of how it's going to be uh, activated for the public. An example might be uh, public sculpture um, or uh, additional uh, uh, public voting facilities. So those are easier to craft by and large. Then this is the last slide from my last presentation. It just, um, I said there's no formula in developing a harbor plan, and here I set it up as a formula. Um, this is just for illustrative purposes. It just means that there are a lot of things that go into trying crafting what the framework is. You take what the objectives are, what the city has laid out uh, for its goals here, you look at the public realm plan, which you've had a couple of presentations on. Then you examine what are the likely substitute provisions that are going to come up in this area, try and figure out the impacts and offsets, develop amplifications. And all of this is set against the state approval standards, which are a series of standards that when the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs reviews a harbor plan, they look at the standards, standards and say, does this meet this standard? Does this still activate the waterfront? Does this prevent privatization of the waterfront? And uh, the secretary's approval can be um, modified. He can modify, he or she can modify the harbor plan so that, uh, for example, uh, some offsets in the past have been uh, not allowed by the secretary and the secretary has actually added his or her own standards so uh, or, or offsets. So that's one thing to keep in mind as we're developing those, that at the end, they have to meet these standards or the secretary could likely uh, change them uh, independently. Any questions on the review? You just but, take off the eight dimensional standards or at least the main ones? Uh, I'm getting to those in like uh, a slide. Um, didn't want to repeat it too much, but we will be getting to those. Um, for each of these five areas, uh, I think I'm, I don't know if I mentioned this. We have like three to five slides, and I can't fit all the information on one slide. So the first slide often raises a bunch of issues that you may go, oh my god, this is horrible. Um, and then I try and explain how we're trying to address it in a later slide. So if it's all right, I would ask that you wait till I finish that section and then I will stop and ask for uh, either questions or comments on the approach that we've developed. So the first one is the geographic scope. And can you still hear me if I walk away? Yes. Yeah. This. Um, so the downtown planning effort that the city has initiated is uh, it's very interesting in, in that the, they've taken a lot of specific neighborhoods and areas that have people that are very much attached to them and care very much about them and have a different quality. And they've tried to integrate them all. And I think they've done a very good job in, in uh, both uh, protecting the individual qualities of each area and trying to make sure that it's not just a series of five or six small plans that don't relate to each other. 
And in this effort, the city is trying to, to combine the Greenway District planning study, the public realm plan, the crossroads initiatives with the MHP. One of the problems, however, is that state rules limit the geographic scope of the MHP uh, enforceable uh, provisions. So in the other areas where you have a uh, fair amount of flexibility to uh, plan and, and uh, look at, at what you would like to do in the area, the MHP is subject to a different set of rules. In the MHP regulation, since the substitute provisions occur within the MHP, there's a presumption that the offsets also occur within in the MHP. So that if you have a taller building or less open space than is required, there's a presumption that you're going to provide an offset, some sort of public benefit in that municipal harbor plan area, uh, ideally adjacent to the area where the substitute provision occurs. Some of you who have been involved in harbor planning for a long time know that sometimes we go beyond that uh, uh, harbor planning area, but it's usually only if, first of all, the impacts from that sub substitute provision have been mitigated within the MHP. So in other words, you provided a public benefit that somehow mitigates for more wind or shadow. Um, the second condition is a significant portion of the public realm plan has been implemented. Uh, the public realm plan talks uh, quite a lot about um, uh, improving the pedestrian experience along the waterfront and, and improving wayfinding and improving the, the uh, uh, water transportation facilities. It would be very unlikely for the secretary to approve an offset outside of this area uh, if a large part of that plan had not been imp implemented. And the third, if there is an offset outside the municipal harbor planning area, it must relate directly to the waterfront. So I, we, we're going to hold off with questions until we're done with each section, and then we'll, then we'll open it up for questions. So we looked at this and we thought, well, this provides a regulatory disconnect because a lot of people and a lot of the plans talk about how do you integrate the greenway with the waterfront. And there are three potential ways that, that we came up to do it. This is where we would like some, some feedback from you all. The first way is to try and do it through the municipal harbor plan. It is possible, as I mentioned, if you meet the other, those three criteria. It's complex and convoluted. It usually takes a longer period of time. And our assessment is that we would be marginally successful in doing that uh, in terms of the Secretary's approval standard. But because we have potential developments that are going to occur in the MHP, and the MHPs are not designed to both quantify and mitigate those offsets outside uh, the MHP area, there's, there's definitely, a, uh, uh, I think, a, a problem in terms of meeting expectations. And two of the ways that we came up with, with trying to address those are, in the MHP, there can be a, a section that describes uh, how the um, uh, city's Article 80 review should proceed. Our city's Article 80 review could easily uh, look at these impacts. And one possible option would be for the MHP to say, because this is a seamless area, and we've looked at it in terms of planning from as, in many ways, as a seamless area, we expect the Article 80 process to use the same calculations that we use in the MHP to register to uh, uh, quantify the impacts on the other public realm areas that are not within the municipal harbor planning area. Uh, Rose Kennedy Greenway, potentially Christopher Columbus Park. Um, so that at the end of the day, when you're done with the entire process, it's the same um, uh, evaluation of the impacts and the same type of offset. A second potential area, which I think is probably a little bit more complex, the state has a provision under the uh, Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act um, uh, for projects in filled tidelands that are in landlocked tidelands, which would include the Greenway, um, that re uh, requires a public benefits determination 
uh, in the MEPA review. That's usually for projects that are actually constructed uh, in this landlocked tidelands area, but there may be a way that we could expand that so that that provision could pick up the impacts from the Municipal Harbor Planning Area and make sure that they're quantified and, and offsets are provided. Linda. Actually, I'm glad you cut me off because this, is, this was the question I was going to ask about the interrelationship between our community and the Greenway. I'm sorry. I'm afraid of uh, repeat, thank you for cutting me off earlier because this was my question um, and the relationship between the Greenway article eight process and the 91 and all of that. And so if it's, if everyone, I think the part of this whole effort was that there's not four or five different documents and rules. So if, if this is the intent, then that's optimal. And it's not just a, you know, a hard line definition of where offsets and, and evaluation of public realm impacts are not. So it's, it's looked at holistically. And if that's the intent, Perfect. Thank you. Tom, yep. um, could you just define substitute provisions, please? I mean, since that's a basic building block of what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the substitute provisions are uh, for the eight dimensional requirements. Uh, it, it sets a different numeric standard. So if the building height is 55 feet within 100 feet of the water, a substitute provision would allow it to go, uh, almost always it's higher, uh, but it can go either way. I'm going to uh, recognize Vivian, and what I'm going to try to do is, at least for uh, each one of these sections, is to recognize folks that are uh, engaged in the committee. And then uh, there's a section at the end, which is uh, uh, making this available for public questions and comments, so we'll hold off to that section. So Vivian, did you have a question or point? So Tom, I'm a little confused by what you've said in this slide. Yep. Uh, specifically as it relates to potential options under the MHP language on Article 80 and also public benefit determination. So, working backwards, one could not have a property owner, for example, or us say that a public benefit determination piece part of that is that it creates jobs, for example, construction jobs. Because generally it does have, while all of these projects, you know, whether the building is 55 feet or 550 feet or 5,000 feet would create jobs. That is not generally the type of public benefits that we are talking about, right? Correct? For the Harbor Plan, correct. Correct. So people should understand that because we, we've used these broad definitions. And, and I've heard at other sessions, not to this process, but where, where a proponent will say, well, the public benefits I'm going create X number of jobs for construction and permanent jobs. So that is not what we're talking about for this determination. And then my other question is under the Article 80 review. That is part of the whole planning and zoning review, which is to show that the Municipal Harbor Plan can be enforceable and implementable. But we are not um, using the Article 80 pro review process as a substitution measure for a Municipal Harbor Plan. The Municipal Harbor Plan constructs the outline of what is approved. So even though something may have been approved by the city's Article 80 review, right, it does not bind the Municipal Harbor Plan, which the Secretary is going to approve. Right. What we were looking at this was sort of the reverse of that, which is the Municipal Harbor Plan providing direction on to the Article 80 review on the project when it gets to that stage on how it would like to see the project review. So it's it's at the MHP. Trying to, to figure out how to ask this question without sounding self-interested. But can an offset an offset doesn't necessarily have to be on private on public property. It could be on private property on another property within the within the MHP area? Uh, I think so, yeah. Provided it's a public benefit 24-7 or whatever, yeah, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be on public property. Public okay. Tom, could you please go back one slide? Um, so in addition to uh, what Tom referenced, um, I was trying to figure out who was speaking. This is me. <laughs> um, 
you referenced that we could use other regulations to try to relate the Municipal Harbor Plan and its potential benefits uh, as a way of kind of keeping tabs on it, uh, so like the Arctic Lady process. But you also mentioned there are these exceptions that relate to the Municipal Harbor Plan itself. Right. And I think it's important that we focus on these as well, because as Vivian said, this is where the relationship to a Municipal Harbor Plan and what the Secretary approves actually has some binding significance. And to the extent possible, uh, if we're looking outside of the defined municipal harbor plan area and we can meet this criteria, we might seriously consider that because that's the way in which we can make the municipal harbor plan have some more substance and also relate to things that might be contiguous to the municipal harbor plan area. Um, and so that's important to consider. But, it, you know, obviously, Tom, has, has these exceptions, have these exceptions been adopted in other municipal plans? Yeah, uh, these are not written down. These are based on uh, a review of other har harbor plans to see what characteristics um, uh, existed that allowed uh, offsets to be done outside of that particular municipal harbor plan. So these are, are, are generally um, what would be expected. But the, the, the standards for approval are pretty clear that you have to take care of the area that's directly affected um, in the Municipal Harbor Plan. And that's why we wanted to uh, raise these other issues as, you know, should we pursue, should we pursue these further? Because we, we understand that there could be a potential disconnect uh, if there uh, is a big expectation that uh, there are going to be offsets outside of the, the uh, Harbor Planning Area. And the, there were discussions at the beginning of the process about the study boundaries itself and the uh, westerly edge of the line and maybe the inclusion of the greenway parcels in the study area itself. Uh, that may be a little tricky because that um, Atlantic Ave uh, is the uh, boundary between jurisdictional tidelands and um, uh, landlocked tidelands. So uh, we, we tried to figure out the easiest way to do it, um, recognizing that, that uh, there's, a, there's just a jurisdictional disconnect here. The road is the description, so it's the first I see. Well, um, there's, that's going to be one of the opportunities or the creative challenges, I think, related to this process. Um, relative to the idea of extending what is obviously some open space that relates to the waterfront and making sure that the relationship is something that we can consider in this harbor planning process. Um, because those parcels have always been tied to the idea that they were stepping stones to the Boston Harbor. So I hope that we can figure that out. Any other questions on geographic scope? Okay, Tom, move on to the next area. All right, I think that, that's great feedback, and that's exactly what we want to hear. We will be looking at that and seeing how tightly we can nail that down in an MHP so that uh, there's some degree of surety as you go forward. Oops. There we go. So uh, now we're getting to the actual substitute provisions. And uh, I keep changing the photograph on this slide, but the uh, the uh, descriptions are the same. Um, I've arranged them here in terms of um, uh, three groups uh, relating to this particular municipal harbor plan. The top two are the two substitute provisions which are most likely uh, going to be needed, uh, both for open space and building heights. The open, there are actually two provisions for open space. One is what we, in shorthand, call the 50% provision. It actually says for every uh, square foot of built space, you have to have one square foot of open space. And in Boston, that generally translates to 50-50 is the standard. Uh, the second is building heights. Uh, again, 55 feet within 100 feet of the water, stepping up uh, two feet, uh, one foot for every two feet backwards, uh, as shown in the uh, photograph that's Harbor View? Harbor View in Charlestown. And that was built as a Chapter 91 compliant building. So the front part of it is 55 feet in height. 
it meets the open space requirement, uh, the height part steps up um, so that you get uh, roughly another floor every 20 feet back that uh, the building goes. How do I define what open space means? <laughs> open space, uh, it's not uh, solely grass and trees. Uh, it also can include um, uh, up to 50% of the open space or 25% of the parcel can be roadways and sidewalks. Does that number make sense? Four plazas, um, and it's nondescript except no buildings. Uh, the next two Can are that for the formula. Yeah. Okay, if you take the whole parcel, the open space provision says half of your 50% open space can be roadways and sidewalks. So that translates to 25% of the overall parcel. So it's 50% of 50%. I didn't write these. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. Um, the next two are, are uh, substitute provisions that we think might be needed, but we're not sure. We haven't gone into detail on some of the proposals. Um, facilities of private tenancy, uh, there's a provision that you can't have uh, what we call FPTs, overflow uh, tidelands. Um, that could be an issue at the hook site. A large portion of that site is on pilings. Uh, so that's considered being overflow tidelands. You're on pile supported piers with water underneath. And I'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit further. Um, the fourth one is the water dependent use zone. Again, I don't think that will be a huge issue here, but I want to cover it so that you understand what we're looking at and why it's potentially not, uh, I think for this area, a, a, a big issue. Um, the remaining four are down at the bottom, not because they're not important, um, but because they are unlikely to require a substitute provision in this harbor plan. Uh, you don't anticipate uh, extending any uh, pile-supported piers out into the water sheet. Um, the open space on Commonwealth Highlands has a higher level of public benefit. Um, that's probably not going to be an issue. Uh, the Harbor Walk uh, probably needs some, some adjustments to make it completely uh, accessible and, and functional, but in terms of the dimensional require, require, no, requirement, which is 10 feet with the uh, city provision that it be 12 feet, um, that is also not probably going to be an issue. And then uh, facilities of public accommodation um, also is unlikely to be an issue. So those, those are the eight. We're looking at two in, in particular and two more um, as potential issues. Want me to? If we, could, if we could pull our comments until the end. There's just a question about, I didn't understand what he was saying, but the building heights and uh, uh, what the provision, what the standards are. So the idea be behind the Chapter 91 standard is that if you wall off the, the waterfront um, with a with a tall building, you're you're making it less conducive to public uh, enjoyment. And so there's a statewide standard that says with, if you're within 100 feet of the waterfront, your build a new building can only be 55 feet high. As you get further back from the waterfront, you can step up uh, two one foot up for every two feet back as a way of, of trying to limit the wind and shadow impacts and not getting the sort of walled off feeling. And the reason you can offset that is if you have other things going on on the waterfront that bring people down, that's seen as a way to mitigate the extra height. Could you just explain number six again, please? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, <clears throat> If you have a project that's on uh, Commonwealth Highlands, so for this project, sort of further out on, on the wharfs, for example, um, uh, let's say, uh, this is the end of Long Wharf, means that you have a higher level of public benefit that you have to provide, um, whether it's in, in uh, uh, interior space or exterior space. 
end of this. This is the this is the substitute provision, so I'm gonna go right into open space. What, what, so I think Bud yeah. has a question on this section. <clears throat> Sorry, it might spill over it might spill over to the open space. But last meeting we had a very interesting conversation of trade-offs between height, open space, and a concept which I think is central to this public realm plan, which is a very big emphasis on more perpendicular visual and pedestrian connections to the waterfront, between the waterfront and the greenway. Where does that concept get played out in these criteria? Or how could it be played out? Follow me? Yeah, I think that, um, let me see if I cover that when we talk about the open space, because each of these areas, some, some have more specificity in terms of how you offset them in the regulations, some have less, and you have more flexibility, say, with a height offset than an open space. Um, so, so if I don't answer that, um, come back and say, dirty rat, you said you were going to answer it, you didn't. Is there any questions on? Suzanne? No. Uh, uh, okay, so when you're doing the municipal harbor plan, are you going to include items or projects that would require offsets or could require offsets? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but it may be clearer once I get through the framework that we're proposing to evaluate the uh, substitute provisions and how the offsets work. Imagine there are going to be a lot of people again saying, you didn't answer my question. So, move forward. Open space. So what we tried to do here, we heard a lot of uh, comments about open space and the importance of open space. So in order to try and capture all of them, we came up with four different components because uh, there are a number of different objectives and because it's a, it's a very sort of unique area of the waterfront. There's a lot going on. The first one is sort of a basic one and it's, it's tied in with the second one. It says new developments may exceed a 50% building footprint but with a parcel specific maximum cap on lot coverage. So, we're, our recommendation is that yes, the city should allow and the harbor plan should include the ability to expand beyond a 50% uh, building footprint. Um, but the second part is making sure that there's a cap so you don't go to 100%. There were so many uh, comments about opening up the waterfront uh, and having view corridors and breaking up the building and uh, the built environment that we thought it was important to say Yes, you can go above 50%, but there's going to be a percentage cap on it. What that is, I don't know yet. Um, and we will need to do some evaluation on this. We need some input from, I think, this group. Um, but the concept is that you want to provide some flexibility for uh, a developer. I mean, I'm not a development expert. I don't know how much area you actually need. Um, but you also want to be true to what uh, uh, we've heard from the charrettes and, and from all of you. So that, that was the answer to my question. The second paragraph. Yes. I'm not sure it is, but I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Run away. Quit while you're ahead. Okay, so this is the second part. And this is different from what's been done in the past. In the past, there's been a flat, sort of per square foot fee assessed if you don't, uh, or is one of the uh, offsets, if you don't meet the open space requirement, for every square foot that you do not meet the open space requirement, you pay a fee. It goes into improvements in other open space or in other parks or so forth. And it's been flat whether you use the entire parcel or go to 52%. What we thought, and some of you may have seen the uh, Paul McMorrow article about building height, where he made the comment about, well, I don't know, you know, if it's three stories taller, do you really notice the difference? Well, that's exactly what I had been thinking. I was walking along 
um, in, in the harbor planning area. And I thought, what I noticed the difference between a building that covered 50% of the open space and 55%. I thought, probably not. I mean, maybe if I went like this, I would. Um, some people would, but I thought that that was a less, um, there was less impact from that. So I, I don't want to get into any numbers specifically, but just as an example, um, I'm going to use carrots. Um, not dollars uh, as an example, but say your building footprint was between 50 and 55 percent of the lot coverage. Then under this uh, framework, you might pay three quarters of a carat for every square foot that you exceeded the 50 percent. The idea being that going to 55 percent is a fairly small incremental change. If you went to 60 percent, well, you know, I might start to notice that. And the public might start to notice that. It starts to feel a lot bigger than 50%. So maybe you go to a whole carat per square foot. If you go to 65%, that's almost two thirds of the parcel. That's quite a bit different than 50%. And yeah, I think people would start to notice that. The impacts would be a lot greater. So maybe you go to uh, one and three quarters carats. If you get up above two thirds of the parcel, that's a big project. That's a lot of space. So maybe uh, to, to sort of continue that on, you go to three carats per square foot. The idea is you have it, uh, it's not quite exponential, but it ramps up as you take up more and more of the open space. This has a couple of, of uh, hopeful uh, uh, impacts. One is to provide an incentive to try and uh, shrink the footprint, which is one of the standards in the Secretary's approval, and try and the harbor plan should try and uh, uh, encourage modest building footprints and height. Um, but it also allows some flexibility, so that you're not saying the building can only be X amount uh, of the footprint. The third one, <coughs> we may not need as a substitute I wanted to include it here because we, we've talked a fair amount about it. But it basically says if you're an existing building, uh, to have a provision that, that allows for a small increase in building footprint for um, uh, public benefits, for something that activates, say, the north side of, of uh, Long Wharf at the Marriott, then that be clear in the Municipal Harbor Plan so that when the Marriott Long Wharf goes to get a Chapter 91 license, the licensee looks at it, it was built before the regs were uh, implemented, it doesn't meet the 50% requirement, they might be able to license it under a minor modification, but it just makes it simpler if in the harbor plan we say, yeah, we anticipated that if the first floor of the building was uh, largely facilities of public accommodation and it's con uh, consistent with the harbor plan, that uh, we allow some bump outs or some, some additional construction to um, activate the waterfront. One of the things that we looked at, um, uh, I, I'm guessing the Marriott Long Wharf is maybe 80,000 square foot <coughs> footprint. And what would happen if you took 5% of that as a bump out? Does, uh, does 4,000 square feet uh, provide enough room to do sort of the activating things that people are interested in. Um, we haven't quite figured that out. We wanted it to be on a parcel by parcel basis so that um, it wasn't just uh, one entity got to grab up all the space. And then the final one is, um, and I think, but this is the one that I was thinking got to your point, um, was that there's a, the regs are drafted so that um, there's an expectation that if you're, you do not meet the open space requirement, that the offset uh, somehow goes to either additional open space or improving open space. So this recommendation is not a specific substitution. It's basically, as we go through this process, thinking about um, the fact that, that if you don't meet the open space requirement, the offsets should be geared towards for example, the BR, improving the BRE lot at Long Wharf or changes to the pedestrian network. Um, at, Hook, at the Hook Lobster site, um, the, the sort of big, one of the big issues there is the uh, waterfront pedestrian connections. Um, 
that site without good connections on either side uh, really doesn't meet the Chapter 91 standard or the Municipal Harbor Plan standard. It's, it's a small parcel that is surrounded by free, busy roadways unless you have those waterfront connections. So here, I think that, uh, uh, again, if there needs to be an offset for open space, um, that's probably where it would be directed. That's the last slide on open space. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Um, this last reference to open space is one of those subject areas that relates to the first set of slides that speak to the geographic boundaries of the Municipal Harbor Plan and the related impact area. Because um, one of the, the uh, themes in the public ground plan was to look at the relationship of the waterfront to, to the waterfront, but also to the relationship to other connecting uh, public and civic spaces as well as open spaces. So I guess one of the questions I had was related to the the, I think something in the earlier slides that you referred to is defining uh, public benefits within MEPA that might relate to the Municipal Harbor Plan. Could you explain that a little bit more? Uh, I'm going out on a limb here because uh, that provision really is for projects that aren't in Chapter 91 jurisdiction but are on filled pilots. And we thought that maybe we could convince, you know, if there was support for that approach from this group, we would go to the state and say, yeah, but I don't think it was ever anticipated that a project in a municipal harbor plan area that's in Chapter 91 jurisdiction would then have an impact outside the municipal harbor planning area. So we'd have to, um, we'd have to explore that further. Um, could it have other applications? Potentially, but I'm, uh, I'm, that's not a foregoing conclusion that we can do that. It's more sort of saying we're willing to explore that if that's something that the group wants us to do. The filled tidelands, uh, how westerly does that line go? Uh, the filled tidelands, you mean for the, the landlocked tidelands? Goes from the eastern side, stops at Atlantic Ave, on the, on the eastern side of Atlantic Ave, and it varies. Um, it extends along Broad Street almost. Yeah, I mean, to Broad Street, and then it curves in almost to the uh, to the base of City Hall. So, I think it's worthwhile to examine that relationship, um, because the public realm plan uh, speaks to those opportunities. <laughs> And I think we need to be ready to consider it um, and should do some homework to see if it will fit. Well, remember the earlier slides that Tom was uh, showing that related to the geographic scope of the Municipal Harbor Plan and um, his um, a, a real serious attempt to try to clarify kind of what and where um, offsets might, might occur and how they might relate to the Municipal Harbor Plan and the ge ge geographic area. And then he explained some exceptions on how that might occur and how it occurred in other Municipal Harbor areas. But then he also talked about maybe two regulatory process, processes that we could potentially use to help relate benefits that might uh, be outside of the impact area. One was the, the Article 80 process and one was this public benefit definition as it relates to MEPA and its relationships to the Municipal Harbor Plan. And so, um, um, since the beginning of time, as I've thought about the Municipal Harbor Plan, I've always thought about how does this relate to the Greenway, and how does this relate to the Customs Tower area, and how does it relate to areas that help connect these areas with one another. And so that's why I'm asking these questions about, so okay, okay, so that this all makes sense. We, first of all, I guess he's saying the Municipal Harbor Plan has to take care of the area within the Municipal Harbor Plan, first and foremost. But if there's any opportunities in the discussion that we have in the advisory group to think about things that might relate to outside of the, the actual municipal power plan area, I'm asking him to examine those and to help us figure that out. I definitely don't know the answers to those questions either. But I at least want to try to pursue it. Because I, uh, one of the best examples that I saw 
when we were planning the Greenway was the relationship, for example, to Long Wharf to, to the Custom Tower Place. And, and you and I were part of the Wharf District planning process, and we saw how the historic connections between those areas made a lot of sense relative to one civic place. So I'm trying to see if there's a way to help realize some of those opportunities by looking at them as part of the plan. Um, but uh, can you slide back to number one, Tom? Back to my earlier question. You, I wonder whether you all should spend some time, I don't know if you could do it generically, but to try to define what view corridor and pedestrian dimensions might be like, or is that something that would just have to be done on a case by case basis? <laughs> I'm thinking of what Kairos was talking about at the last meeting, and without offending the Intercontinental Hotel, I think everybody would agree the alleys either side of that probably don't meet adequate visual and pedestrian connections. And so something bigger than that, I, I, you're just suggesting you might be thinking about that how to define it. Uh, we were thinking about it, and to, to me that really gets into what's the upper level of uh, lot coverage that the group in the city wants to allow in an area um, to, to make sure that, that uh, those new corridors and, and whatever other public you know, benefits from, from having those corridors uh, can take place. I, I don't know the answer. Um, the Greenway guidelines that also specified discrete locations that were important to maintain or create few corridors as well. So there's some guidance to that document as well, but the specific dimensional metrics, I think that's more of a parcel by parcel discussion rather than having a standard throughout. Um, could you turn to slide four? Um, I have a question for Chris Bush. It, it lists here at the BRA lot on Long Wharf, which is owned by the BRA, right? Yeah. <coughs> is it the BRA's intention that we can talk about as open space, or do you see it as a future development site or continued parking? So uh, is it even in the realm of possibilities that we could green that whole lot? That's been discussed in that context yeah, in a number of public forums. So that it is. is yeah, so that's something. Yeah. So you do not view that as a development site? No. Okay. And the second question would be, the VRA or the city owns Long Wharf, right? So one of the possibilities, if we were being very bold, was to say, green the plaza. Turn it over to a big lawn, right? Green, the end of Long Wharf, or just the If one was to be very provocative and think about storm surge and using green to deal with, you know, absorbing some of the water and such, Somebody could say, green, the end of Long Wharf. That, that is a BRA parcel, right? So that could be as provocative. That's a possibility in terms of open space. I guess the reason I'm saying this is I'm a little concerned about the discussion about substitutions and going outside of the MHP area. It's starting to feel a little bit like a Christmas tree or, or a Hanukkah you know, menorah, whatever we want to use as a symbol. And I don't mean, or Chinese sea, whatever you want to use, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of anyone's religion or ethnic background or whatever, but you know, the impacts of increased height, less open space, do impact the immediate area and those who live in that immediate area. And I have heard our colleagues who I love dearly say, well, maybe the benefits could even go out to the Harbor Islands or Custom House Tower. And those are all very worthy, and probably, you know, Lois, you might even think of a way to connect to the Charlestown Navy Yard, right? Um, but I, you know, as we think about this, and we're not gonna discuss it here today, I do think you need to keep a perspective, because everybody who is sitting around this table and then some represent very good interests and public interests. So I love the Harbor Islands. I go out there all the time. But is that the offset for what might happen at Hope or Harbor Garage and such, and you know, Custom House Tower? So I think we should think about that. I am overbooked, so I, I'm gonna leave right now and I'm, so no one can throw pellets at me, but I do think <laughs> we've been dancing around, and I've asked what the schedule is. We've danced around the hard work. We are about to come soon to having a real discussion. What is the height? What is the setback? What's the geographic? And I think it would be useful as we get into the summer seasons and we're heading in that direction. We need a schedule. We need a chairman who's going to lead the conversation about how we're going to do this. Because otherwise, you're going off. You know, you talked about a substitution of potentially of 
less open space, 65%. I'm like listening to these numbers and I'm saying, he couldn't possibly mean that. He was just being provocative. But if that's what we are talking about, then I really want to have a conversation. A real soon conversation. Because we need to give the BRA a sense of direction. The Missoula Harbor Plan, we on the advisory committee, we're only advisory. They can do whatever they want. But you need our advice, if you really want our advice, then we need to have some time to give you our advice. Not at the end of this, when then the community is also wait, waiting to speak and, and no one else. So I, I would strongly suggest that. Just, just to be clear, um, when I said 50 to 55, 55 to 60, 60 to 65, 65 to 70, it's because I can't deal with like individual numbers. I have to have chunks. None of the numbers that I've thrown out and or the carrots are um, real numbers. They're just for example, so that you can to try and get across the concept of a, a ramping up of the offsets. The, the, I guess the other thing I think it's important to note is that Vivian's correct to suggest that what Tom's outlining is the beginning of the kind of meat of this effort. And, but I want to emphasize it's the beginning. Uh, so this will get lots of time for discussion and very thoughtful consideration. Uh, and I know that's what uh, Chris and Rich and Tom are, are, you know, they're basically trying to set the table for us to understand the boundaries and the, and the considerations of, of moving forward and the kind of guidelines. Can, uh, and this is the beginning of that discussion. Um, so um, I know that there's been a real good willingness to uh, have a good Conversation regarding these matters, and, and we've have can, had, had had some folks from the from the from the audience ask some questions. So first, I'm going to ask this. Uh, I'll, I'll get right back to you, sir, because I just I just saw this woman's, and I'm being. We're going to try to be more uh, democratic regarding this process. So yes. Yeah, I, I'm a Towers. I just wanted to know if the only disincentive for expanding mm -hmm. footprints is carrots. Is that what you're saying? Well. Um, I think the disincentives first are the maximum amount of, of uh, percentage no, of... No, is it money? No, there are, there are also the planning objectives that need to be adhered to. So we have a number of objectives that were outlined early on in the planning process that really are going to be guiding the discussion as well. So those are the basic criteria through which we're going to have this But I'm discussion. wondering why you even use the term 50% footprint, because it doesn't seem to mean it. Again, that relates to a regulatory standard that, that, that is in place. I mean, that's hard to do a regulatory broken. process. Yep. It's totally arbitrary. Well, that's, that's um, we've, um, this issue has come up in the past, and, and this is basically, um, uh, as I said, we don't like to call it a variance process, but it is, is in fact, acts like a variance process. So that's the standard from which um, uh, you need to offset if you exceed it. And the standard way to offset is some type of financial payment. Yes, but of course, you might as well just use the word, use the word carrots then. Because for some people, money means no more than carrots. Uh, and I, we're looking at a situation where we really have to protect the open space. So I think we, so, we, we, we will include that questioning, and we'll go to the next question. Right. Sir. I think um, I've got two questions, one of which I think is a very quick question. And, in this process, you used two terms. One was, I think, build space, and the other is building footprint. Are they the same? Uh, yes. Okay. And, and the other question yes. is, is, is maybe a harder one, but, and maybe it's just my inability to think it through, but we've gone through a process of several years, and many of us have participated in a, in a Greenway district planning process, which led to recommendations and which is anticipated will lead to zoning over, over the relatively near future. And that affects some of these same parcels that would be affected by the things that you're talking about. I had always envisioned Chapter 91 as imposing further restrictions on waterfront development, not as an end of, not as throw up what's been done before and start fresh with a new plan that's based around Chapter 91 requirements. Can you explain better to me the relationship between the two? Well, in general, you know, our, our harbor plans have advanced and, and developed from local uh, master planning efforts. So in this case, you know, the Greenway study serves as that, that master planning effort. Um, I think as Kairos had indicated at the last meeting that 
Um, you know, the, the current mayor and administration recognized that, you know, it's a planning effort, but they did not have any uh, oversight or involvement in that process and are looking for um, this advisory committee to review a number of different scenarios to look creatively at the planning area and the parcels within it and come forth with, with recommendations. Um, and to your question on zoning, you know, that's, that's part of this whole process, but it follows on um, the submission and uh, Secretary's decision on the Municipal Harbor Plan. You know, for this Wharf District area, that zoning will follow at, at, the, end of, at, at the end of this process as sort of an implementation mechanism. Um, some of the other districts within the Greenway have been zoned over the past year and maybe you know, zoned forthcoming, but that specific to the, the downtown waterfront area, that, that's gonna be sort of the final bookend of the process. But, but we ought not just to throw up no, I know. I know it does serve as, as a true guidance document that, that we are following. Um, we'll entertain a few more questions from the audience. Tom? I just have a question about number four. Um, number four, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to be a restatement of what exists. Is it, This is a proposed change. Is it a further restrictive change, or is it a does it expand what's possible? I, I, I don't quite understand the this difference. This is not a substitute provision. This is just another characteristic of the open space framework. So it, it basically says that if you have, if you have to, uh, if you need a substitute provision, then the offsets should be linked to other open space related uh, uh, projects to improve the ground level experience. Within the MHP. Within the MHP is the primary primary focus. That doesn't already exist in, in, in the rules. I thought. I thought that yeah, it does. that's what I'm saying. This is not a substitute provision. This is a component of, of the framework for looking at it. So if you if you the first two are the primary, um, more than 50 percent, some cap on the top, and then a gradation in the offsets. But this one just highlights the the uh, the idea that whatever the offsets are they have to go towards either more open space or improving existing open space. Within the geographic area. Yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't change anything. This is just how the regulations uh, uh, sort of focus um, the characteristic of an of a open space offset. There's language in the regulations that, that really directs it to open space improvements. So I'm going to, uh, and I know that uh, some of the questions and answers are sometimes complicated and, you know, it's reasonable that people want to drill down and get the best possible answer, but we only have so much time. So if people still have questions even after they've finished their conversation or I've had to move on to the next question, feel free at the end of the meeting, obviously, to talk to Tom a little bit more. So we only, again, we only have uh, time for a few more audience questions. And then at the end, we'll come back and, and ask the audience if they have any more questions. So. Don't, I don't want anybody to feel bad if I, if I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a couple more and then at the end, if you want to hold on to your meeting, I'll, a question, I'll, I'll get to it then. But first, uh, let me go to Suzanne Lavoie, um, who's uh, uh, got a question. Go ahead, Suzanne. With the Hook Lobster site, if they were to comply with the 55 uh, foot height, um, they would not be required to do an offset, correct? If they did 55 feet in height, did not build on the IO supported piers and did and and met their water dependent use zone um, criteria, then they would not have to do any offsets, but that's a very small portion of the site. But they would still be required to support the harbor walk. Right? I mean, well the harbor walk would be um, yeah that would be part of their water dependent use zone. It would be a requirement of Captain 91. But that would not be considered an offset. No. Um, sir, could you uh, introduce yourself? Um, Jay Marlin, I have a unit at uh, Hobbit Towers, and uh, we've had a good idea of what is going on here, but uh, for years at Hobbit Towers, it's been the question of what's happening with the garage, and Mayor Menino had cut that down, and Mayor, uh, the present mayor is kind of talking about letting things go higher, is there anything that's going to be covered in that uh, anywhere along the line with uh, this meeting, the next meeting, or meetings 
back to that. Yeah. You know, we're, we're right now we're just discussing sort of the theoretical approach for the overall planning effort. In future meetings, we will be getting into the parcel by parcel specific discussions. Um, my hope is in May to get into the, the Marriott Long Wharf property and, and start reviewing that. And then after that, we'll be getting to Harbor Garage with this. These meetings will be noticed with agendas you know, well in advance of the meeting, so there will be you know, good notice you know, heading into those, those meetings as to what's going to be covered. But I see you have a question. So just to follow up, Chris, so we're going to, what you're essentially proposing for the process here on out is that we're going to try to work up these dimensional substitutes Basic on a parcel by parcel basis, yeah. not generic wide for the whole MHP, but on each developable parcel. That, that's the way this is framed is, is that, you know, in terms of the height and open space is on a parcel by parcel. So. And so, you know, if you, if you read the Globe, they sort of pitch this, at least on the garage side, as a decision between the mayor and, and Don. But we need some assurance that if we're going to put that kind of level of work into it in the way that you're proposing, that our good friend, the new mayor, is going to pay attention to that. Well, I'm not judging whatever the answers are, whether, you know, whatever the heights are, whatever, but we need sort of some assurance that we're not going to waste a lot of time and effort because this is going to be a really demanding and very specific yep. task to be done properly. And, um, you know, we were a little thrown off by what Cairo said last week or at the last meeting based on his conversations with, with uh, uh, Mayor Walsh. I hope what he was saying was we've been asked to sort of look at this with a fresh eye. Exactly. Yes. Given everything we've learned so yeah. far, and not that we're going to put a lot of work into this and then somebody else is just going to make the decision. Is that my hearing no, that right? I think, you know, that the mayor's office, fifth floor, you know, looks for guidance from this committee and, and we'll be looking for, you know, substantive recommendations and, you know, we'll move from there. But I'll take that concern back to, to City Hall most definitely. But. Um, Okay, we're gonna uh, move on to the next agenda item. I just wanted to ask a, a, a specific question regarding this issue of open space as well. So, and it relates specifically to something that Vivian Lee raised. Um, more today regarding the relationship of open space and also the relationship of the harbor, questions have come up regarding strategies to improve the resiliency of the waterfront and efforts to do that relative to protecting property and obviously the safety of the public. Um, I'm not aware of any precedent relative to past municipal harbor plans as it relates to that subject matter, but it might be worthwhile to check with MEPA to see what their relationship to resiliency is as it pertains to future offsets as well. And to, to understand kind of the new set of uh, challenges that we're examining regarding water as well, uh, and whether or not resiliency would, would in some way fit within the open space category. Yeah, good good point. I think um, the city in its note, a request for notice to proceed last summer uh, outlined that uh, resiliency was one of the issues that it wanted to uh, tackle. There is a consultant on board to help with that effort. Um, and uh, I think that, that in terms of some of the offsets, in terms of improving the open space, that definitely falls in that category to make it resilient and reusable very soon after, you know, if there is a, a, a storm event. The expectation of the construction. Great. Well, um, thank you. I, as I mentioned before, we're definitely going to have time for public questions and comments at the end of the agenda. So we're going to move on to. Um, I still have more of this presentation. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was the last. <laughs> no, it's just open space. <laughs> <laughs> now we get to building heights. So, I have a general slide here just to talk a little bit about building heights. Um, I think there's a there may be a perception that municipal harbor plans um, somehow limit building height, and they're really uh, not about how high the building is. They're about what are the impacts of that height. So there's no real limiting factor in terms of the height of a building in the MHP regs. But if you exceed the Chapter 91 regulations for height, you have to quantify the impacts, mostly through wind and net new shadow, and you have to offset them. 
But that doesn't really mean that you can go as high as you want. Um, there are other factors um, that, that, that uh, play on this. Uh, the scale of adjacent buildings, uh, the famous TERPS, which inexplicably stands for uh, Terminal Instrument Procedures. Um, it's a, an FAA term for um, the height around an airport um, above which no structure can exceed. And the whole Boston waterfront is governed by these TERPs. So that's another factor. Uh, there are numerous others. But it's not specifically the Municipal Harbor Plan that says you can't go higher than a certain level. Um, one of the things that um, uh, we want to take a closer look at as we get into this is that the ground level shadow impacts from tall, thin buildings may have less net new shadow impacts than shorter, bulkier buildings. And I think Kairos may have touched upon this, that a taller, thinner building acts for uh, sort of the shadow moves faster across the ground level environment than a uh, uh, shorter, um, bulkier building. And with uh, offsets for height, there's generally a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you use it. Remember I said that the, the language in terms of offsets for open space generally uh, require you to, to target uh, the public open space or open space in general uh, for improvements or for uh, additional open space. Um, for uh, uh, height uh, shadow impacts, uh, there's a little bit more flexibility on that. <coughs> this one has two more slides. <coughs> and the recommended approach is, is similar in terms of how we structure the open space uh, uh, framework as well. First one is, yes, new developments may exceed chapter 91 allowable heights, but with parcel specific maximum caps. So uh, there will be an ability uh, under this framework to go above what's uh, allowed in chapter 91, but at some point there has to be a cap that says uh, this is, you cannot exceed this level. And then the second component, um, where the offsets are based on the net new shadow at the ground level, uh, we measure that using two matrices. And this is, this is a little bit different from what we've done in the past on this. First of all is the overall project impacts. So the larger the magnitude of the net new shadow, the larger the per square foot offset. It's very similar to the open space where uh, we'll set certain levels uh, that uh, there's a certain dollar amount or carats or however you want to figure it out. Um, if, if the shadow impact is fairly small and it increases as, you, uh, as the development um, uh, provides a larger area of that new shadow. And the second thing that we wanted to include in there is that you know, not necessarily uh, are all areas the same. There are some really uh, sort of unique public open spaces that we should build in some type of mechanism to try and uh, either limit or restrict the net new shadow on those areas. Um, one that came to mind, I'm not sure how the shadows would work on this, but the end of Long Wharf is sort of an open area that doesn't uh, get a tremendous amount of shadow now, get some. Um, that may be different from somewhere closer in on Long Wharf where you get sort of a, a, a kaleidoscope of shadows from different buildings and it's hard to tell where the shadow from, from new buildings might be cast. So we wanted to see if we could do a, 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 um, an evaluation uh, so that uh, to try and steer building design away from impacting the areas that were uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, key public open spaces. Well, just quick clarifying on that topic. Can that consider the time of day and time of year shadows as well? There's a, there's a date, October 23rd? Yes, yeah, really October 23rd is the standard is looked at and it's, I believe, uh, it's sustained shadow over an hour is, is the standard that's been used in the past. So, so you I'm, get... You know, I'm looking at our bar there uh, at the aquarium, you know, which is kind of irrelevant on October 23rd and is really important between May 1st and October 1st for the peak traffic to the aquarium is between, using our outdoor plazas between 11 in the morning and 2.30 in the afternoon. Those sort of temporal distinctions be considered something like this. I mean, the standard 
metric that's been used is that is that date, you know, with a real focus on the shoulder season, understanding that you know shadows during the summertime may you know cool areas and, and provide for a more accommodating pedestrian experience in some locations. October being a time of year when people are still out and about enjoying a lot of the public realm in these open space locations. So I think that's why that that, that is the focus of, of that, that specific metric, but you know we can discuss that as we get into analyzing um, shadow impacts with various scenarios forward. Yeah, I think that but that gets to the second one of where are the you know, where do you have a lot of people congregating or where are there unique spots that you want to try and protect to the extent that you can. Yeah, you know, in the Graves case, we can spend 10, we want to spend 10 or 15 million dollars to upgrade that plaza for a lot of outdoor use during the obvious summer. But no net new shadow. No, I, no, I don't know kidding. what the shadow might be, but that's obviously more important to us than what happens on October 23rd. Bud's unique in this area in that his facility is actually a water dependent use, so he's not. Uh, Governed by any of these things, so he can build the most <laughs> giant, <laughs> enormous structure uh, if he cares. Can to I write it, that so. down? <laughs> that's that's uh, that's the the um, that's all I have on height. So next one, okay? Facilities of private tenancy. This really is only an issue at the hook site. Um, this is, uh, I mentioned this earlier, FTTs, residences, and most offices, private clubs, and pile-supported piers, um, overflowed tidelands uh, require a substitute provision. You can see on this where the green, shows up as light green, in the hook site, uh, that's all pile-supported piers. So a large portion of it, um, you cannot have, even on upper floors, uh, private residences or offices. So this is a very um, sort of constrained site. And uh, the reason, uh, we, we haven't really seen a plan for this site, but the reason we included it as, well, this is likely gonna be a substitute provision we're gonna have to look at, is that it's hard to imagine that they could build uh, on that small square where it says hook lobster. So <laughs> this is another one It's not as, there's not as much flexibility with the offsets. Uh, as you have with height, uh, it's very specific so that if you have private uh, condos and offices, you have to do something to make sure that that specific water dependent use zone does not get privatized. So it's very specific to this area. Um, <clears throat> there's been a couple of examples of uh, facilities of private tenancy over flowed tidelands, and I sort of drew from that list uh, as, as what types of things you might look at uh, in terms of offsets. Um, I think at the presentation uh, on Hook, there was a discussion of doing something in the new, uh, in anything that's done there that involved Hook Lobster. There was reference made to maintaining something from Hook on the site there. What? So um, we haven't talked a lot about a special public destination facility, but it's a facility of public accommodation. So. You know, normally if you just say, well, you have to have an FBA, it's a restaurant or a, or a store. When you get to a, a, what we like to call spittus, um, you give direction in the municipal harbor plan what you expect to see there. So you can be much more um, uh, direct uh, uh, that you want to see, you want uh, an art exhibit, you want public um, performing area, you want something. Um, one example could be that the Municipal Harbor Plan designates uh, the first floor as a um, uh, something that involves um, how, you kept, how you catch lobsters, how you market them, um, something about lobster biology. Um, so and that's where you can, you can uh, be fairly creative on, on this. Um, these uh, the example in South Boston also had, uh, if they redeveloped that site, uh, a facility of public accommodation on the top floor of the structure. Um, I included it here, um, but the building right next door to this, 470, 470 Atlantic Avenue, already has a top floor public observation deck. So I'm not sure if that's something you'd want to include here and have them right next to each other, or come up with a uh, different type of offset. 
Um, I still think that, so I haven't heard uh, how exactly the connection along the waterfront by both the Mopley Bridge and the uh, Old Northern Avenue Bridge is going to be created. I think that a lot of what's done at Hook, if they need some offsets, needs to be directed towards making that connection because this, the, uh, the site will not meet the Harbor Plan standards unless there's a, a good way for the public to access and enjoy that site. So I, I put that in there um, as one of the other options uh, for that site. Last characteristic, or last quality, water dependent use zones. This is the, um, I mentioned a couple times, sort of the building setback, how far from the water's edge you have to be. It's to make sure that you don't, uh, a, a building doesn't impact the ability to have water dependent uses uh, along the waterfront. There's a formula for uh, determining the water dependent use zone. It can be uh, fairly complex. Um, and in some areas you get a water dependent use zone that can go from 10 feet to 100 feet. Um, and as I said, that's to ensure there's enough uh, space for strolling, uh, commercial vessel activity, uh, rod and reel fishing, um, anything that's considered water dependent. This is a really important component of chapter 91, but because of the formula and because you can get these wild water dependent use zones based on whether you're on a pier or a bulkhead and where it suddenly can go from 10 feet wide to 100 feet deep, um, there's general uh, flexibility in terms of configuration of uh, the water dependent use zone. Generally, if you have a substitute provision um, to reconfigure the water dependent use zone, you don't have to provide an additional offset if the new water dependent use zone is equal to or greater in area than the, what you would have had to have done under chapter 91. And if it provides equivalent or better area for water dependent uses. We've seen some proposals come in where they put all the water dependent use area sort of on the street, away from the water. And that doesn't meet the criteria. It has to be somewhere up front. But generally speaking, there's a there's a acknowledgement that <coughs> The formula doesn't doesn't always uh, result in uh, uh, you know very usable space, so there's more flexibility in terms of reconfiguring that. Um, there are exceptions for unusual sites and certainly for existing buildings. Um, this building, has, uh, for one example, did not meet the water dependent use zone, but there was a determination that there was enough uh, uh, offsets from other things that it did not negatively impact. Uh, the ability of the public to uh, engage in water dependent uses. That's it. So, so that framework um, is something that we're going to try to use as a guideline and a set of references as we go forward. One of the things, um, Chris and Tom, for you to consider as part of the education for all of us is, um, and maybe at the next meeting, is to uh, show examples from other municipal harbor plans of how uh, they use that framework and what specific, and you did try to do that uh, in a couple instances where you, for example, you talked about how a SPDF, a special destination, uh, could be, has been accommodated, for example, in another. But I think, honestly, because I, I, I can tell by the, uh, the uh, glares of the folks in the audience, that I think the education process needs a little bit more attention. And I, and, and so if you could give people, first of all, some reference to how other municipal harbor plans have used this framework to come with, up with uh, offsets or substitutes or actions so that they can see examples of how other parts of the waterfront have, have taken advantage of this framework to help achieve public outcomes or public benefits that we think are important relative to the Inspiro plan. I think that's one important educational opportunity. The second one is you you are all going to go over the public realm plan next. Yeah. And so the idea could be is how does the public realm plan relate to some of this some of the aspects of this framework? So maybe at some point you could show the correlation of the public realm plan and how you could achieve public realm plan related outcomes 
while using this framework and what might be some good examples of that as well. So again, I think I'm just asking for some additional table setting for you to consider relative to the public education of both the steering committee and the audience. So you don't have to answer now, but if you can well, just, consider it, I think it might uh, be helpful. We are trying to go through uh, past harbor plans and come up with a, uh, a table that, that shows, um, you know, here's what the substitute provision was back in 2000. This is what the offset was. So that you have some reference uh, to put it in. It's, it's a, since they're all wildly different in terms of the framework, uh, and even coming up with the direct correlation, um, the one that I helped consistent. Yeah. Actually, uh, the other part is that uh, is the, what the city submits and what the secretary responds, um, and they don't always match up, so you have to marry them two together. So we're trying to. There are general categories simple. like height, exactly. open space, exactly. where you could show examples. Yes. Where there were open space we're elements of the, you know, so those are the general categories. We specifically did this plan where you have the height, the open space, the water venue, so just we, those four. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Yeah. And again, you're just showing examples to everybody here yeah. about how this was done in other areas and what other people and other steering committees and other public forums helped to answer these questions. Uh, because I, I, I do think that it would be helpful for the, the audience and Absolutely. for the public to have a sense of how others got through this process and how they came up with responses to these questions, okay? Right. Uh, and uh, 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 so first of all, Linda, uh, do you have a question? Or a comment? Go ahead. It takes a little while. Uh, no, okay. Yep. Um, maybe just to pick up on what Ricky said, and um, sort of going forward, I, I sense that people are still in a reactive mode a little bit about um, what, what it was before, and if you do a comparative thing about this is what it was before, and what. but moving forward and sort of illustrations of successes that have happened in ways that maybe think, I mean, this is the whole vision thing, thinking out of the box, looking forward. Um, what could be? I have to confess, if I were a developer sitting here for either of those two major sites, I would not know what to how to shape what I'm trying to do relative to what's proposed. And um, it's some successful examples of this moving forward. I think which will open people's minds to like what's possible. I don't mean go backwards and start at ground zero and sort of start back at vision stages, but maybe just like well, how could this stuff be implemented and made real? would probably go a long way from people's fears about like, this is going to take away my particular view. Um, I, I don't know if that's even a comment or a, just a broad, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions regarding this framework from the steering committee? <coughs> but this is probably an outrageous suggestion, but if you could make a 3D model of this district that was literally maybe half the size of this table, it would be invaluable for the rest of this process to help us really visualize what's there and what might change. I'll get my daughter on it too. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea for a funding source. <laughs> if you do, that because it would I be mean, really we, we obviously have a you know the model room at, at the BRA. Um, you know I can look in to see if it's you know, the individual on staff who builds those could do a mock-up um, of the downtown waterfront because that, that could be helpful. I'm sorry? We meet here sometime instead. Yeah, yeah, it's a little tough for a crowd this size, but um, we'll see what we can do. Sometimes, um, you mentioned uh, that this is the framework. This is the proposed framework from the consultants, which has no standing whatsoever, um, so that you can, uh, 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 you know, the reason we're presenting it is because we want some feedback. And uh, good, bad, indifferent, don't understand, um, it's basically to say, this is what we thought based on what we know about municipal harbor planning, but it may not be what you as a group want to see in terms of how, what, you know, how you evaluate the buildings. So um, we designed it, uh, we wanted to do this presentation so as you get into the details of individual projects, um, it may help as a framework to say, oh, I see, 
that's going to trigger uh, a, a height offset, or maybe that's going to be a big height offset, or a big open space height offset. Does that work? And you can come back later on after you've had a couple of these in-depth presentations and say, you know, I think you missed something here, or, yeah, that works. Let's keep that, but change this. But will you put these in concrete before we talk about the individual projects, or are these going to be sort of continuing to move in place? I think they continue yeah, the to guidance, move. These are sort of guidance principles that sort of provide some type of context or framework going into these parcel by parcel specific discussions. So you know, just to, again, provide some foundation from which you know we can initiate discussion. So they have some standards. They have some. I was joking because I'm, you know, my <laughs> consultant. Yes, ma'am. This is another uh, reaction to the Globe articles last week about the this is a, another uh, question about the Globe articles last week and in terms of the uh, specific things like the garage and, and uh, our new mayor suggesting that he wants action and he wants to see things moving forward. This seems like a ve very slow, I mean you're not going to be getting to, the, to what he's already seems to be pushing for for several months and I think that is that, is that really working in sync with what the reality you know, that can, if a decision is made at City Hall, is it correct to say, well, if they make the decision to move forward and you are still back here, is this going to be in sync? Are you are you working in sync? Is that possible? Again, the, you know, the mayor is looking for recommendations from this advisory committee, right. so we he have to move in process. He was talking about really moving this forward and going and, and starting this. Like the, I mean, the timetable of the globe is quite. I didn't see any timetable. Well, all I know is we're working on developing this municipal harbor plan. We're hoping to have something drafted in into the state uh, by the end of this year, early next year, and the, it goes through the state approval process and has to be codified through zoning. So that's you know the the task that we have at hand. Tom, um, you mentioned this framework as you know a starting point and something that obviously we're all taking very seriously. But it's fair to say that this framework is something that has had the benefit of standing on the shoulders and being informed by other municipal harbor plans that have been done in the city, isn't that correct? Yes. So I, I want people to know that this framework isn't arbitrary. It's, uh, and I've only, and I'm sharing this with you because I've been involved with many municipal harbor planning processes uh, as a planner. And so this is, uh, this is not unique, it's not different, it's not something that we haven't looked at in East Boston, in South Boston, in Charleston. And um, so this is a framework that has a lot of consistency relative to how we think about these things. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that people understood that from a historical perspective and also from a past practice perspective. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna ask one last time about our, um, I know we have a second agenda item to cover. So what I think I'm gonna do is because of it's 4.30, I'm going to uh, go ahead to quick review of the public realm plan. Review of uh, um, the um, comments that the advisory committee had had to that point and, and went over the basic revisions to the plan. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago we issued a, a revised updated plan that incorporated that, that information and that material. Um, so that has been out and about. We had some copies, uh, I guess we're sold out at this point out front here uh, for people to take a look at as well. So. Um, this is really just an open forum, I guess, first and foremost for the advisory committee. If you have any further thoughts on on this plan, and then open it up to the public. Um, I know it initially indicated we'd like to get most of the comment back within the next week or two. The intent being we want a fairly uh, well formalized plan by the the May advisory committee date, as we are getting into the more parcel specific discussions. Um, but if we could, you know, bring together comment within the next couple of weeks, that'd be great on that. But uh, the advisory committee. Uh, we'll just pull up the plans we have that uh, peruse if need be here. And Chris, it's probably is it the case at this point that the public realm plan might be on the on the BRA's webpage? Yes, it is on the webpage. Um, you know, I, I sent out notice through uh, the distribution list uh, to most everyone with the address to, to download that. So if anyone has had any problem accessing that, please let me know. And, um, and what you're suggesting, Chris, is that now and two weeks from now, if people have comments, they should share them with you. They can either do that verbally today or 
if they want, they can share writing, writing, write, email, writing comments. Or right. Exactly. Okay, you want to pull up the public document so we can talk about it? Chris, before you get into that, can we just clarify what the public document is? Yeah, I mean, it'd be great to have them by the 16th of, of May. It's another three weeks. It's been out for the past two weeks, so. Um, and th again, this is something we've been reviewing over the past few months. So May 16th is the deadline for public comments on the public realm thing? I prefer to have things by that point, yes. Yes. And, um, So if you remember, Tom talked about two kind of guiding principles regarding the Municipal Harbor Plan. One was the Municipal Harbor Plan objectives, which are in um, and, and presented to us early in this process. And then the second was the Public Realm Plan. And both of those things serve as a guide and a reference to the Municipal Harbor Plan and the potential substitutes and offsets that we'll consider. So that's why this plan is so important. Any questions from the steering committee on the public realm plan at, le at this time? But just a, just a quick comment. Uh, I think really to commend the um, BRA and their consultants. I think it really reflects a lot of the directions that we asked for in the in the last meeting and various written comments. And I think the section that's activating the downtown waterfront and the kind of main themes that are laid out in terms of connectivity, legibility, activation, and programming are kind of right on what what at least some of us were looking okay. for. And I just ask you to sort of do one last double check to make sure that the more specific stuff reflects those themes, which I think it does by and large, but okay. we could just go through one more time. Yeah, at the end, um, the implementation section, I think has most all of the, um, you know, activation, programming, conceptual ideas that were raised, broken down district-wide, as well as the specific um, sort of sub-district areas of Northern Avenue, um, Rose War, Media Row, as well as the Long Wharf Central Wharf area. Um, so again, if that's where a lot of the detail and meat of it is, and it's broken down in a way that responds to the, the goals or visionary um, concepts that are raised, as well as sort of implementation components as well. Um, so we just want to make sure we capture everything on that phone. Yeah, I, I want to just a, a general comment about the detail because I think it's important. Uh, our first draft was uh, perhaps a little bit by design, um, maybe a little bit more generalized. Um, through a lot of feedback that we got, we were encouraged to not hold back but to be much more inclusive of detail, specificity, etc. So uh, we've really loaded it in there. Uh, I think the nature of this document is uh, it's it's by definition a kind of inclusive document uh, because it's really um, a kind of list of all of our aspirations for the area and there didn't seem to be any reason to sort of really cut anything out but I would I would ask that those of you who really want to spend some time with the document and perhaps submit some comments allow a little time to weed through some of the some of the fine print at the end of the document because um, if you think something's missing um, you might find it there. Matt, would you mind introducing yourself quickly? Sorry. <laughs> I'm Matthew Littell. I'm a, a principal at UTO, or an architecture and planning firm, and we, um, we are uh, helping the BRA run this, this planning process. Yes, and, and we are responsible for preparing this plan. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Suzanne, did you have any questions? Go ahead. A document that that has a lot of detail and information in it. One of the items that I, I saw here regards uh, the establishment of a management group to oversee um, uh, the the goals. Can you clarify what the intent of that is? Well, you know, I, I think the, the the idea was something like the Four Point Channel Operations Board, which acts as um, somewhat of a business improvement district, but for the waterfront. 
and they manage a lot of the activation funds that have been leveraged through uh, some of the waterways licenses for downtown waterfront um, projects. So the thought being is we've got you know all of these activation programming concepts, there may be funding tied behind that. It needs to be managed in some type of holistic way, you know. So maybe the thought being to have some organization of the downtown waterfront that serves to, to manage and facilitate funds or you know put out for grant opportunities for public art or these other types of activation concepts so again it's just a, a conceptual idea to help again facilitate a lot of these concepts moving forward is that a private or public group it would be a voluntary organization i, I think with the uh the, the Four Point um, Operations Board, the members were formalized through the consolidated written de determination or possibly one of the secretary's uh, determinations on the municipal harbor plan for that area. So um, again, it's something that's worked out through the state as well. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, a couple of quick points and then we'll turn it back to the audience. Um, this has uh, been an evolutionary process regarding the public ground plan, and it's I, I have to agree with uh, Suzanne about a much richer public ground plan that gives us plenty of opportunity to think about how we might make the wharf and the waterfront and the neighborhood much better. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Um, the other thing I guess I'll go back to is um, under those categories of height, open space, et cetera, you might be able to show examples about how the public realm plan might fit into that framework again. Yeah, but I think if you show examples, I think if you show examples, I think it will help get people to understand what we're talking about. Uh, and kind of at least, you know, I don't think you should fill in the whole chart because I think the steering committee and the public will, will do that. But if you could show some examples about how the framework for that, uh, the municipal power plan might relate to the public realm plan and show examples again at one of the next meetings it will help provide the educational basis for how people can think about this going forward so again past examples of municipal harbor plans and how they relate to the framework and i think this public realm plan how they relate to the would be a great kind of uh, boilerplate for moving forward sure. and, and giving people the, the 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 benefit of of how to think through the next steps um, all right, so, ma'am, you had, and if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, yes, please, yes. Um, Toby Bernstein, I've lived on the waterfront for 23 years, and I was curious, on page 27, there's a little dotted line that goes right through Harbor Tower School with an arrow. What does that mean? Does that mean you're going to build a bridge over it, or take it by Emily Domain, or what do we, what do we do? Like there's nothing to offside it's, property fees. It's a, it's a reference to uh, uh, view corridors, not necessarily a bridge or physical access, but uh, one of the goals has been throughout here to connect the greenway and the water, both physically but also visually. Um, that is a kind of distinct open space piece, and so we raised the question in this plan, is, is there an opportunity there to create not necessarily physical accessibility, obviously, because it's private, but is there some way that uh, a view corridor could be maintained there while, um, so that one could sense that the water was there without maybe compromising the privacy. So essentially it's a wish list. Yeah. Uh, there are many wish lists on this, yeah. on, in this document. Primarily what this is. Sign? Uh, I have a, a signage of my name. Uh, I live on the waterfront. front as well. Uh, and some of you know I'm an architect planner and I directed the original downtown waterfront project and I've done several buildings in the waterfront. My question is for you, Mr. Chairman. Instead of trying to put into words some of the things that I'd like to comment on, I've read the document. Excuse me. I've read the document very thoroughly. It's a very well put together uh, document. On the other hand, I think there are some things that I think would be very valuable to raise both to the committee and to the public here. Uh, instead of doing it in words, I did some graphic work, and I like to present it. I don't know if uh, you'll give me that opportunity to, to do that. I put it up on the wall here, or on easels, and 
essentially raised some questions about connections, uh, both through the waterfront as well as connections between the waterfront and downtown and downtown and the waterfront. So that's my question to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Cy, do you have a sense of how much time you would need to do that? Yeah, I'd probably need, I, I guess, maybe 10 minutes, something like that, okay? Because it's graphic work. It's not, it's not just words. And um, I think it will provoke some discussion. Cy, maybe what we could do is uh, uh, give some people in the audience that have a chance. Because in theory, sure. the meeting's supposed to end at 5. Sure. And so maybe what, what we could do is come back at the end. Right. Like that suggestion, and, sure. and give you a chance to do that if, if that's okay. If, sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good side. Thank you. Stay right there, then. Then, um, ma'am, and then sir, go ahead. If you wouldn't mind again introducing yourself. I'm Mary Holland. Um, I live on East India Road. I don't want to talk through this. I need some clarity uh, about. I'm getting the impression that the mayor can go ahead and make commitments and encourage developers separate from this that would in fact make this a rather um, impotent document if that's the way it is. Can I get some clarity on that? <laughs> Again, my you know, understanding, as Ms. Kyrus said last week, is looking for, looking for the advisory committee to review a, a variety of scenarios in the box, out of the box, all over the box, and, and come forth with you know, recommendations as to what may be viable that you know, answers to the, the planning uh, principles that were outlined early on with this process with a notice to proceed um, you know, that relate to the, the Greenway guidelines and, and go from there. So I mean, that's as specific as I, I can get. Um, so we don't really know how effective this can be. Well, again, this is an advisory body that was, um, you know, serving at the, you know, the mayor. So, you know, he's looking to this body for recommendations. Um, I, I do want to mention again, to provide some historical context. Every time a municipal harbor plan process has occurred, that document has been used as a reference to guide future development. So I just want to give you a sense that that's the way it's worked in the past. My gut tells me is that's the way it's going to work going forward. So, um, um, and I think Chris is trying to reassure us of that. Um, sir, in the back, I'm sorry. Oh, 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 this gentleman and then you. I'm sorry. Uh, hi, it's Andrew Revito from Hobbit Towers. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in the creation of the uh, view corridors to the north. Now, given the fact that Boston is not and never will be a great city, the idea of uh, cars seems, you know, uh, to the water from the city seems like a rather moot issue. And my question is, however, doesn't the harbor lot itself provide all the views to the harbor that one could only dream about in the past? And as a result of having that, one can then turn around and get a wonderful view of our very diverse skyline so that we could actually have the best of both worlds without too much fuss and going through people's property. So I'd like to know how you respond to that. Well, you know, I mean, one of the Again, primary planning principles that, you know, part of the Greenway study and, again, a foundation for this process is, is you know, connectivity, improving legibility, spent billions of dollars removing the, uh, the, the central artery viaduct, spent billions of dollars cleaning up um, the harbor, you know, and the intent is to draw these connections between the downtown, the Greenway, and the waterfront, and a key aspect of that is, is visibility. Um, you know, this feeds on the crossroads initiatives that builds off of, you know, State Street, Congress Street, Summer Street. And, you know, I know we're dealing with an old cow path type exactly. street system, exactly. exactly. but, you know, it, where opportunities exist um, from an urban design context to open areas up and open access and visibility to the water, we just want to try to take advantage of those, those uh, opportunities where they arise. Well, I guess it becomes a question of just how important is that in terms of disturbing what is really not a grid. And we already have a, a path along the waterfront 
which exposes that waterfront to view as 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 you could best dream about. Yeah, and that's from the water side in, but we also want to take a look from the city out towards the harbor as well. So we have a two way. It's really not possible without a grid city. Um, thank you, sir, for your comment. Um, sir, would you mind introducing yourself in the back and, and asking your question? My name is Steve Wilstein. I'm a resident at Harbor Towers as well. Uh, I have a question of whether the plan takes into account the traffic and environmental issues as well as the impact on tourism in the area and residents. Uh, right now we have pretty much gridlock, especially for a couple of hours every day, people coming, uh, to passing International Place, for example, where people exit a building about for about two hours, and there's gridlock of, of people coming out of there. If we had big buildings on the harbor side, there might be further gridlock the other way, and it's it, it means an impact on life and tourism, and, and if you have a mixed-use uh, complex like an office building, people are generally all leaving between, say, four and six, and that creates gridlock all along there, and it impacts the entire harbor. So I'm wondering if that is part of, you know, the considerations. This was an issue that came up earlier in the uh, process. So there's two pieces, uh, uh, two responses. One is that ground access issues that relate to the waterfront and to the harbor and the water sheet are absolutely uh, considerations that are uh, part of the municipal harbor planning process. Um, and um, as you heard from uh, Tom and, um, and Chris, that the um, roadways and sidewalks are considered part of the municipal harbor plan as it relates to the open space equation. So those are the relevant aspects of kind of transportation, if you will, as it relates specifically to a municipal harbor plan. The larger impacts of development and relates to transportation are part of the Article 80 process, which is that other regulation and process that the BRA goes through when it reviews large-scale development projects or even modest uh, development projects. And then there's a transportation access plan that's associated with that development review. And that's where public comment and dialogue really you know, gets, gets really uh, uh, very candid and very directed relative to those larger concerns that you have regarding the scope of development and its transportation impacts on an immediate, immediate area. Okay. And there's also uh, currently, as I indicated early on, the uh, South Boston Waterfront Transportation Plan, which uh, was initiated uh, about four or five months ago, and it's a multi-city state agency effort led by ABC looking at um, you know existing constraints and traffic issues and how you know, multimodal solutions can be brought to bear to accommodate existing and future build-out uh, scenarios. And that area of study, I do believe, gets out onto Atlantic Avenue and carries north from there. So that is an area that, that's subject to analysis and review. It is a, an issue that, that, that's being looked at regionally and, and there's an ongoing study right now. But for, it's, not, it's not just the traffic that I'm concerned about, it's the impact of residents and tourists in the area that they don't, might not want to come to an area or go to the harbor if they're cutting through, you know, like a lot of traffic, a lot of, and a building that's, a tall building that's an office building on the waterfront. Because an apartment building doesn't have the kind of, you know, access, and you got people aren't leaving and coming in the same time. They're going in all the time, but it's an office building, it's a very different kind of complex. Yes. Um, again, public access and mobility yeah. are, um, get taken care of in a development review process. They get taken care of, as Chris mentioned, in planning processes. Um, there's been some discussion with the city about doing a central artery corridor transportation plan to look at the surface artery and the kinds of questions that you're looking at. And of course, all of the customers that use transportation, pedestrians, visitors, et cetera, get considered in those plans. And as Chris mentioned, the surface artery is in the impact area of the South Boston transportation plan, particularly the area of Northern Avenue, Seaport Access Boulevard, et cetera. So we'll be looking at that relationship, at least as it relates to the South Boston waterfront as well. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions from the public and then we'll turn it over. Oh, Ron. Huh. Ron, Ron Fillion with Mass DOT Highway. Um, can publicly accessible rooftop open space, either planted or otherwise, be considered as open space offset? Um, we see there is some some planted areas, for example, here on Atlantic Wharf, 
the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, those aren't necessarily publicly accessible, but I'm just curious as, as something that has some benefits aside from just pure open space, but in terms of helping <laughs> cool the uh, cool the local environment, is that, is that a possibility? Um, if you were going to try and do that, we would not suggest you try and characterize that as open space. Um, the rigs are fairly clear that they're, it's ground level, open to the sky, um, open space, but you could potentially craft something where as an offset to not having enough open space, um, you create a special public destination facility that could be an upper level outdoor space. It would probably have a less, a lower ratio, I have that right? So that if you had one square foot of open space to offset, you need to do two square feet, as an example, of this upper level plaza. Um, and that's because it's, it's generally harder to get people to go up to enjoy that additional area. But you could craft it, just not, it's be pretty complex to do it as open space. Okay, we're going to take one more uh, question from the public, and uh, this lady's been waiting very patiently, and I'm sorry for not getting to you sooner. Hi, Marcel Willock, Harbor Towers. Uh, Tom, could you pull up, I think it's slide two on your height slide, um, just to illustrate the point that Vivian made about greening the area. Uh, I walked up and down. Harbor Towers, the area of our pool and our lawn, is the only green space walking from on the whole side of Atlantic Avenue. So you talk about a view corridor, but having something green, an oasis, and it shows up beautifully in your slide, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it just is an absolute oasis of, oh, okay, next one. Next one, uh, okay, maybe I missed it. The heights, go to the heights ones. I think it was on the heights. Next. There it is. Yeah. All right. See, um, you can point it out. You can see it right there with all the trees right there. I mean, a view corridor is not. There is a view corridor right, right there. But having that little oasis of green yeah. is so peaceful in the city. I lived in New York City for many years, and they create many parklets with little things like that. So uh, I think that you know, granted it's ours, but we share that. We have people walk around it. And uh, we have just committed a major project, which we have submitted to the BRA for approval of our ground plane. And we have deliberately selected Halverson as the architects because they have worked up and down the waterfront so that the plan would be integrated and blend nicely with that. So for those of you who may not be familiar with that, I just thought I would like to share that with you. And I was surprised that Vivian mentioned greening of a long wharf. And here you have green already there, which, and the, as we said, we submitted our plan to you, and the idea on East, uh, in your row, is to make it a sort of a boulevard to walk down there rather than hardscape, and softening a lot of the hardscape around uh, that area. Uh, and this is a very nice document in general, but there are some inaccuracies. There are comments here about uh, the Harbor Walk not being well identified around Harbor Towers property. I walked it today. We have three signs in blue and white. You cannot miss it that it says Harbor Walk. Rose Wharf has a, a very uh, luxurious sign within their uh, metal, one that you can't tell that it's Harbor Walk. There's no sign indicating the ramp for handicap going down on the Rose Wharf side. Harbor Towers does have three Harbor Walk signs. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. Um, I'm going to uh, extend the meeting uh, so that for the purposes of uh, giving Simon a chance to uh, make his presentation, I encourage you all to uh, stay and see uh, size specific graphic recommendations. Yes, I'm Rick Moore, the resident. Uh, two, two questions. One, you, you speak in the uh, in the plan about storm surge, and, and it's a dotted line, and I was just wondering if somebody could explain a little bit more what that meant. And the second thing is on the chapter 91, if we could start with sort of an as-of-right plan of what could be built without any offsets, 
uh, that might be a good way to uh, you know start as a baseline of this like a monorail yes but no thank you for responding to that question on the baseline, when we do an analysis, we look at um, a combination of existing and baseline um, to conduct the analysis for a high speed shadow. So, in order to get net new shadow, um, you need to do some kind of baseline. Uh, it, it essentially takes existing buildings, so you can see what the existing building's shadow creates, and then for uh, proposed new development, you uh, look at the shadow for a Chapter 91 compliant building. So it would be existing plus the Chapter 91 compliant structure in order to determine um, net new shadow. I don't know who asked that question. And it was a storm surge question, too. And the storm surge? I'm sorry, I missed that one. Ask that question. Storm surge. I'm sorry, I missed the question. Well, there's a dotted line in the plan, and I think it's identified as storm surge protection. What? What is that? Uh, in terms of the plan. Oh, this. I mean, in, in the activation plan. That's right. Yeah, there's some there's some uh, places that have been identified as being vulnerable to storm surge. So one of the items on the kind of general list looking forward would be the ways of. Uh, making sure those areas are either reinforced or protected somehow. Thank you, Matthew. Um, hey, Ricky, could I just second your suggestion of a good description of the past, of the past history of municipal harbor plans? I mean, there was a little pushback because it was confusing, but we know what was allowed, we know what was built, and whether it was the state or the city pushing for it or pulling back, we can compare the two, right? And what the offsets were. Uh, it wasn't a pushback, it was just an explanation that it's not always clearly defined. So it, it, getting a comprehensive list is a little bit difficult, but getting one that I think is a, a, illustrative of the types of things that we're looking at in this uh, uh, area uh, is, is we've already started and we've got it probably halfway Fair through. enough, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Tom. All right, um, for, first of all, we're gonna, um, um, Ask Sai to uh, get started because we Sai we don't have that much time. I ask you to try to be quick and efficient with your presentation. You said ten minutes, so I have to keep you to it. Okay. Oh, Sai. First of all, here's the microphone, pal. No. Uh, thanks very much. I appreciate people. Uh, 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 staying. There are really two areas that I'd like to comment on, uh, and they have to do with the connections, both visually and in terms of pedestrians and what we've created in the rest of the waterfront, and how critically it's important to continue that in the Wharf District area. So what I've done is I'm showing here these are all the connections that some of you know if you walk the harbor, but you actually can go all the way through Gillette. You can walk from Gillette, you can cross over at different places, and you can continue along the waterfront behind Russian Wharf, or what they call uh, uh, the new name. This is the uh, Intercontinental Hotel. Uh, the BRA and, and the consultants in the study. This is the hook lobster, but they're also talking about, as you may know, the BRA insisted, rightly so, to make a connection under Independence Wharf, so you can actually penetrate under the building. You continue, and they're going to make a connection, which it, it doesn't exist now, uh, under the, uh, uh, the, the main bridge. Uh, uh, to the seaport, uh, this is Seaport Boulevard, so you're going to be able to go under that bridge, you're going to be able to continue along once the Hook Lobster is developed. Those of you that cross the Northern Avenue Bridge know how important that connection is. It's, we're talking pedestrian connections now, primarily, okay? And uh, there is a connection right now behind the Coast Guard building, so most of you know that. Uh, you know the building next to it, which is a, a private development with a law firm. 
one of the most important developments that has ever taken place in the city, uh, controlled by the BRA, uh, is a place that I used to uh, live for 12 years, Rose Wharf. And one of the things about Rose Wharf is, is that it's all pedestrian. That is, you can walk through and around Rose Wharf. I didn't show you the fingers. You can walk through. So in other words, you have a continuous pedestrian walkway. Then we get to Harbor Towers, and I have a lot of friends at Harbor uh, at, at Towers that I've known for many, many years. And the issue is not so much that you can't get through with the signage, as th this lady said, but the difficulty is, is for most people, uh, it's very difficult to figure that out. And if you watch people, and I'm out there all of the time, people cross in all different ways. So one possibility might be to consider is similar to what's done here, this is the entrance to a residential building. This is the, the, the uh, side entrance to this residential building. It certainly hasn't affected the economics because the, the sale of condominiums here as well as in Rose Wharf is the highest. Uh, the, the highest money is paid for, built for units within this building even though it's all public realm, okay? It's not private. Anybody can go there. And they don't. Some do. Some walk. But they don't disturb. There's music that goes on. So one of the suggestions that might be considered by Harbor Towers is instead of having the walk go around the buildings, which is what happens now, you come through here, through a gate, you go around here, you walk around here, and so on, which means you have public that basically walks around because that's the harbor uh, walk that's continuous and then goes behind the garage, you might consider no, at the no, same... No, it well, goes straight through. Yeah, uh, let me finish mine. You can make your comment, okay? That, uh, and that is that when you, when you make that walk, you might be able to do that very simply, similar to what's here, and discontinue maybe the, the walk all the way around the, the edge and just continue a pedestrian walk all the way through. This is all uh, pedestrian here. And one of the mistakes that was made when the hotel was built was in the controls that were written by the BRA, this was supposed to have a connection, an open air connection through the hotel, which wasn't developed at the time. It's possible to do that, and I will show you on, on, on a, a drawing why it's possible and what's the incentive for doing some of that. So I would suggest to you at least to think about it. You don't need to react. You don't need to say that we can't do it and so on. Give it some thought and consideration, especially the advisory committee here. We're supposed to be looking at a municipal harbor plan for the next, I don't know, 50 years since that's the last one that was done. So you shouldn't only look at what's today, what's there. You should look at the future for your own future, uh, for your own development potential. Sorry, we have about five more minutes. Okay. The other, the, the other connection that I want to talk about is not through the municipal harbor, but it has to do with how this connection can actually be made, okay? And that's what this drawing represents. That is one, of, and, and this happens to be the piece that runs through where the hotel is. Part of the incentive of getting people to do uh, uh, things is to give them a benefit and one of the benefits might be for the hotel to have an ability to expand out the hotel into the parking lot that's owned by the BRA. With the proviso that says that there's an open air connection which physically can be done through the ground floor of the hotel because all of the hotel check-in, everything is up escalators on the second level. You could therefore connect the waterfront the way it used to be, where it wasn't separated as it is now. That is, most people don't realize 
unless many of you that live here might, that you can actually walk through the hotel. It's not so comfortable, but you can, to get to the park and to get to the rest of the waterfront, because the waterfront is made up of Commercial Wharf, of Lewis Wharf, Union Wharf. That's what our waterfront is all about. It's not just, just the central area. So by doing this, that's one thing you certainly could accomplish in a very significant way, offering an incentive. And finally, the other thing that I want to talk about is the critical connection, since somebody uh, talked about it earlier, about the street pattern of Boston. One of the things that you do learn is, is the one street that actually connects all the way back, all the way to Tremont Street, or Cambridge and Tremont Street, is State Street. And if you go to State Street at the foot of Washington and State Street and look down, it's the only place within the city you actually can see the harbor. You can't see it from any other connection back into the city. And that was part of, uh, many of you are interested in the history of the city. Well, that was the history of the city. That's the reason Long Wharf is called Long Wharf, okay? And it extended all the way. So one of the things that I would like to see emphasized, which doesn't emphasize it enough, what is emphasized is Central Street. And while I'm not against having Central Street or any of these streets connect through, for pedestrians I'm talking about, not just for cars, is the fact that you can't really see the waterfront from here because the nature of Milk Street and so on, what you see is the end of Central Wharf, but from State Street all the way back to the old State House, and I have a whole bunch of pictures which I've taken which I could show you, okay, that literally show the fact that you can't see and therefore, one of the priorities that this committee might recommend, which is separate from the municipal harbor plan, but it's a connection, is to put some priority <coughs> on making State Street into the kind of street that it ought to be, something that one could be proud of in coming to the city, because that's where a tremendous number of visitors, as well as the public at large, <coughs> the bus, that so use I, the state. So I, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, you've gotten a, uh, across the key concepts of your idea, Fair enough. and I very much appreciate the time you've taken up uh, to present these ideas to us. And if anybody would like to ask Cy at the end of the meeting to uh, go into more detail regarding his plan, Cy, do you have some time to stay Absolutely. to answer people's questions? Absolutely. Okay, so that Cy will be available after the meeting to talk to folks about his plan. And in the meantime, Cy, obviously, we look forward to any comments you might have on the public brown plan and any graphics or, 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 or written comments that you'd like to make. I thank you, Bob Wicks, and of course, uh, uh, a couple of last words from our public officials and consultants. Um, thank you, Cy, for spelling that out. I think it's this has brought up a very interesting point, which is that the activation plan, which I hope you will all read, um, is not necessarily going to how we achieve all these things, like connectivity, uh, uh, it leaves open a little bit. And I think Sai's work here is evidence that how connectivity happens, how we achieve these goals, how the specific little impasses are resolved from a design standpoint, um, those, all those, that nitty gritty and all those solutions are not actually solved in this plan. This plan really identifies mostly what our aspirations are. Uh, but I think Sai's presentation has brought up a good point, which is that um, there's always more homework to do, and there's clearly more discussion that can happen either through the, the MHD process or even beyond when there are specific development proposals on the table uh, to talk about really how these connections happen. But I think Sai has identified areas that we have at least identified as uh, uh, difficult areas to resolve and areas that uh, let's say, attract a lot of different opinions. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Rick, for sharing today. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks for all for, you, for your attendance. And um, again, any comments, thoughts on the public round plan, do you please forward those comments my way. My contact information is on the agenda. 
uh, to the VRA webpage. Um, next advisory committee meeting is scheduled for May 28th. I'll be here at Atlantic Wharf. And one last comment, one of our advisory committee members, Lois Sagelman, is involved with uh, Friends of Harbor Walk, a new organization. Right, we just uh, wanted to let people know that there is an organization being formulated right now um, under the purview of the Boston Harbor Association, but it's going to be independent. They're just helping to set it up. So if anybody is in a business or a condo association or a friends organization that has an interest in the Harbor Walk and wants to see about its maintenance, promoting it, uh, scheduling activities, doing all that sort of thing, please let me know because I can get you on the contact list and invite you to the meetings. We have one tomorrow evening at 5.30 at the Boston Harbor Association. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lois. Thanks again, all of you.